One of my professors said, you have to teach your patients not to believe every stupid thing they think. Thank you. And I'm like, <laughs> I have a doctorate degree, not one class on how to manage my mind. Something they should have taught me in second grade. Yeah. You don't have to believe every stupid thing you think. Thoughts come from all sorts of places. They may not even be yours. Thoughts can actually be from another generation. We know generational trauma actually gets transmitted through our genes. And then pretty soon I'm predicting the worst possible thing, even though not one bad thing happened to me. Hi, I'm Dr. Daniel Amen and psychiatrist, uh, father, and you're on Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Everyone, welcome to another episode. Dr. Amen, welcome. Thank you so much. Excited to be here. I usually ask my guests, how did you get this job? So I'm one of seven children. I'm third, which in a Lebanese family, I'm the second son means I'm irrelevant. So <laughs> start with, I was irrelevant. You're a middle child. Okay. <laughs> middle child. And um, when I was 18 in 1972, Vietnam was still going on and the United States had a draft and I had a very low draft number. So they put all the birthdays into the hopper and mm -hmm. you know, from one to 365, I was 19, oh. which meant I was going to be drafted. Oh. So yeah. I ended up as an infantry medic where my love of medicine was born. Okay. But about a year into it, I realized I didn't like being shot at. <laughs> I liked being helpful. Yes. I didn't like being shot at. It's like, no, yeah. I, no, it would upset me. And so I got myself retrained as an x-ray technician because okay. I love photography. And I started taking pictures of people's bodies. And I love that. And our professors used to say, how do you know unless you look? Mm -hmm. And that became very important in my development. And then 1975, I got out of the army, was in uh, finished college, went to medical school. And in 1979, when I'm a second year medical student, I got married. And then a couple of months later, my wife tried to kill herself. And I didn't grow up around people with serious mental health problems. And so I had no idea what to do. I took her to the chief of the Department of Psychiatry at Oral Roberts University. That's where I was going to medical school. His name was Stan Wallace. And I came to realize if he helped my wife, it wouldn't just help her, right? that ultimately it would help me and it would help our children, would help our grandchildren. And so I fell in love with psychiatry because I realized it could help generations of people. So for the last 44 years, this is personal yeah. to me. And I fell in love with the only medical specialty that never looks at the organ it treats. And given my x-ray background, my imaging background, how do you know unless you look? I knew it was wrong. I knew it would change. I just had no idea I'd be part of the change. And um, I mean, there are steps along the way, but in 1991, been a psychiatrist for almost a decade. I went to a lecture on brain spect imaging. It's a nuclear medicine study that looks at blood flow and activity. It looks at how your brain works. Mm -hmm. And I was blown away. And I just started ordering imaging on virtually all of my patients and it changed everything I do. Now, the good thing for me, when I graduated from medical school in 1982, I wanted to be a really good psychiatrist and a writer because I was irrelevant growing up <laughs> and I got a sense of connection and relevance by teaching people what I learned. And I'm actually really good at taking things that are very complicated 
and making them so a third grader can understand. Yeah. And the writing part of my professional life sort of worked. I've written 42 books, 19 of them have been national bestsellers. So I like that. Um, I have a trait that, that Einstein said was key. He said, you know, you, you don't know it unless you can explain it to like a five-year-old. So that's, that's the concept you're talking about is being able to take super complex issues and distill it into information that the masses can understand. Yeah. So how I became to be who I am today is the mission is personal. I want to communicate it. And I have learned so much from looking at the brain. I was blessed to see Tony Robbins. He came to my clinic and he and I did a Facebook Live. And I love him. I love his work. I think it's so awesome. I said, but you do software programming. If people have hardware problems, it's not going to work. Right. And so get your brain right, then your mind will follow. And this foundational piece, hardly anybody ever talks about it when it comes to success, but it's the foundational element of success because if your brain's not right, you're not right. Yeah. And I can co-sign that. And I'm sure everyone else who's watching and listening can as well. And that's the number one reason I wanted to have you here is because it's personal for me too. You know, um, I, I became an entrepreneur for the first time, you know, maybe 15 years ago. And it was such a rude awakening. I had no idea. It seemed very glamorous <laughs> on the outside. Oh, I'm going to work for myself and be my own boss. Uh, you know, I'm going to have so much more freedom and flexibility and I'm going to be able to spend so much more time with my family. And then you do it. And yeah, you do have that freedom and flexibility, but like you realize, okay, now I'm, I'm working 24 hours a day. It's for myself. But like it's, it's uh, the grass is not always greener in terms of you know having so much more flex time or whatever. And I really struggled with um, the mental aspect of it. Uh, for me, I still and if I'm being honest, I'm I still carry around guilt from those days because it was 2008. Okay, uh, set the scene for you. I, I had a big job at the uh, at the studios. Uh, I had you know flying first class out to New York City to meet with Hollywood movie stars, uh, had everything paid for me, had all the all the luxuries, and I was spending all the studio's money, $50 million worth usually on marketing and advertising. Uh, then to go to starting my own company, which was much more modest and humble, but I had uh, clients and, and people lined up. And in January 2008, everything was going great. And by se September of that year, Lehman Brothers collapse. It was a disaster. And everything goes away. And suddenly I'm in panic mode. I've got, at the time we had three young children who were in elementary school. Uh, we now have four, but at the time it was just three. My wife was not working. She was, you know, working in the home, managing, you know, the home and the family. So that was stressful and, and difficult. And I was the breadwinner. And suddenly, you know, everything that we, all these best laid plans were gone. And I, I didn't know what to do. I, you know, a uh, lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, a lot of like uh, sleepless nights, some tears, uh, some fights, uh, arguing, trying to figure out, okay, how are we going to make this work? It was the most stressful time of my life. I took my family on this roller coaster that they, they didn't sign up to go on. If it was just me, single man, you know, I could live under the freeway in a cardboard box. No problem, you know, hunt for food every day. But because I was taking my family through it, it was, it was the, it was, it was the worst time, very hard time. Um, and I wish I had some coping mechanisms, some skills. I wish I had some more brain training to help me. Uh, so maybe we can talk about that. You, you identified that entrepreneurs are hard on themselves. They, they don't take breaks. Maybe they don't work. What have you learned about people like us? Well, one, a lot of entrepreneurs cope with bad habits, mm -hmm. whether it's not taking time to exercise, it's eating fast food, it's drinking, or using marijuana to manage the stress. And I always think of my patients in four big circles. It's what's the biology and how do I get that right? What's the psychology? When we were growing up in the San Fernando Valley, 
there were no classes on how to manage your mind. Right. right, it was so important, and now we're living in this epidemic of young people with mental health challenges. No classes on how to manage your brain or your mind. It's insane. There's a social circle. How do you manage your relationships? And there's a spiritual circle, which most psychiatrists won't touch. But it's so clear. It's like, why are you on the planet? You know, yeah. what is your deepest sense of meaning and purpose? And does your actions fit what your purpose is? Is it tracking? And, that? and so, if we just look at some simple strategies, because I like to be really practical in the biological um, circle, it's every day ask yourself, whatever you're going to do today. Is this good for my brain or bad for it? Like I did an hour in the hyperbaric chamber today. And it's like good for my brain or bad for it. It's totally good for my brain. Okay. Right? And what I've eaten today and what I've drank today is good for my brain or bad for it. It's good. Um, so, and that's not about, oh, you should do this or you should do that. Because entrepreneurs don't like shoulds. It's about love. Mm -hmm. I love myself. So I'm going to put my brain in the healthiest place possible because then I'm a better leader. Yeah, and you're right. I mean, it's you're sort of calling it out. I'm even embarrassed to underscore it that I don't think of my brain as an organ. I think about you know my heart and my lungs and you know other you know, liver, kidneys. You know, I forget about up here. This seems more like a muscle. <laughs> it's the most important thing. I mean, yeah. it's the CEO. Yeah. of your life, yeah. right? And there's actually a, the front part of your brain, it's called the prefrontal cortex, is called the executive part of the brain because it runs things like goal setting and focus and forethought, judgment, impulse control, organization, planning, empathy, all the things a good CEO yeah. should be. Kind of important. Is the front third of your brain, which is why you should never let your children hit soccer balls with their forehead. You should not let them play uh, contact sports where on average they get a concussion a year, like in football or hockey. Uh, golf is good. Tennis is terrific. Table tennis is the world's best yeah. brain game. My, my son runs track. Track is awesome. Um, although one of my patients, and it's public knowledge, I do a show on Instagram called Scan My Brain. Alicia Newman it just became the 2023 World Indoor Pole Vaulting Champion. <laughs> I watch her pole vault. Yes. So scary. Yeah. Please for, hit the mat. For me. Yeah. Um, it's that one question though. And I remember it's also public. I, I'm in Justin Bieber's docu-series Seasons because I've been his doctor. And he came into my office one day and like many of the cool celebrities I see, they come, they don't come, they do it, I say, mostly not. And um, about four years ago, I went through a really hard time. And he came into my office and he said, I think I got what you're trying to tell me. My brain is an organ like my heart is an organ. Mm -hmm. If you told me I had heart problems, I'd do everything you said. Right, yeah. I'm going to do what you say. And then he's gone on and has done much better. Y you got to love it. And it's the moment-by-moment -moment functioning of your brain. So it's how your neurons, brain cells fire that determines your success. So if you're never thinking about it or every night you're drinking a disinfectant alcohol and poisoning it, your decisions aren't going to be as good as if you loved your brain. Yeah, I love that. So let's unpack that a little bit further. So food and beverage is, um, you know, at the top priority of how it's affecting us. I would guess that, um, well, so I've talked a lot about on this series, my personal health journey. So at 10, about 10 years ago, I started to get pretty significant headaches. And so I went to see a series of doctors. I saw the neurologist. I, I, I started checking the big ticket items first. Like, let's, but, let's see what's happening up there. Make sure you don't have a brain tumor. Yeah. So I, I <laughs> want to rule that out is fine. Uh, next. Oh, and then, but the neurologist said, oh, you, you just have migraines. So here's pills. 
And I, I thought, okay, you know, I'll try this. But then as I extrapolated that idea, I, I'm not going to take that until I die. What else is there to do? So I went to a heart, heart doctor. Anyway, it was a very myopic. But what uh, about what's causing them? Right. <laughs> if you don't know what's causing it, how do you treat it? It's like everybody comes in, I'm depressed. Well, here's an antidepressant. Right. When there's a hundred different causes of depression, yeah. really, you're going to assume everybody's got a serotonin deficiency, yeah. and give them Lexapro. It's like, that's insane. Well, so for yeah. the migraines, it's like, why? Right. And, and that was my, again, it seems so intuitive, it's embarrassing to talk about, but I really, uh, as doctor after doctor, and I saw all of them, went from head then to heart, did the carotid artery scan, heart scan, saw a pulmonary expert, um, checked my teeth, my eyes, all that. And each one had a very myopic view of their specialty, which is fine, understandable. But they didn't talk about the, the causes as much. And so I felt like I needed to take responsibility for my own health. I needed to take that back and be responsible. And so I started to research more about the foods that I'm eating, the you know, uh, how much am I working? How much am I sleeping? All of these contributors that were, were probably affecting it. Um, so you touched on uh, food and beverage, alcohol, obviously. We're numbing with other or escaping with other um, things. What are some of the other? Mushrooms, they're in. Okay. Every interview, I'm like, what about psilocybin? And I'm like, and why is that a good idea? Yeah, people are, you know, I get insights. It's like they're polluted insights. <laughs> um, I read Will Smith's book in February of last year, right before the Oscars, when his life blew up. Yeah. And he said he'd gone to South America and did ayahuasca 14 times. I'm like, well, that didn't fix anything. Wow. Obviously, if you're slugging Chris Rock on national television. Yeah. Um, it, there's so many things we do to feel better now, but not later versus let's do what makes me feel good now and later. And whenever I think of migraines, I mean, the first thing I do is like, what are you eating? What are you drinking? How are you sleeping? Do yeah. you have an infection? Like, I'm glad you got your teeth, Jack. That's yeah. important. And then go, let's go on an elimination diet just for like a couple of weeks. Yeah. And, you know, eliminate gluten, dairy, corn, soy, artificial dyes and sweeteners and alcohol. Yeah. And then see how you feel. Yeah. And so many of my patients, their headaches go away. And I'm like, well, let's just add one thing back and see if we can find the troublemaker. Yeah. What happened for you? That's it. That's exactly what happened. I, I thought it was was uh stress and anxiety mm -hmm. it turned out i did do a sleep test that i had mild apnea uh i was getting uh little palpitations once in a while i was uh, having unusually high blood pressure i'm fairly athletic i'm not super overweight i could i could lose a few pounds but and and it was my heart doctor who said you should go get a sleep test because your 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 blood and these symptoms are kind of aligned with apnea and I didn't know much about it, but long story short, I uh, I lost 10 pounds. Uh, I got a new bed. I focused on getting to bed on time and, and correcting my sleep cycle. And uh, I started sleeping on my side. Anyway, the apnea disappeared. And then I focused on nutrition. So sleep first and then nutrition. And I started taking out all the things that I were making me feel terrible, whether that was the you know the donuts or the <laughs> the desserts took all that out and i started feeling myself again and i still get a headache once in a while but not like i was getting before and it was sleep and nutrition then I, and then i put in exercise and i was more diligent about that and putting those three things together for me was it cracked the code for for my dna other people who have migraines should look into something called the Erlen syndrome, I-R-L-E-N, for people who've had concussions in mm -hmm. the past or people who are light sensitive, wearing colored filtered lenses make a huge positive difference. And it's there are few miracles in psychiatry. That's been one for a lot of my patients when they learn that, okay, I have a visual processing issue and light 
certain colors of light activate my brain wearing the lenses um, helps so much. So they can learn more about it. It's free. Erlen, I-R-L-N dot com. Mm -hmm. Take some of the self-tests. Great pro tip. Um, I also met Wim Hof, uh, and Wim convinced me to start, you know, baby steps with cold showers, uh, or at least, you know, start with my normal shower and turn it cold at the end. And uh, at least that gives me energy. It makes me feel good. I don't know if it's placebo. What's your take on uh, cold therapy? I think there's evidence that it can help. It can help decrease inflammation. The more inflammation you have, the more headaches you're going to have, the more pain you're going to have. I'm not a huge fan of suffering, but so my <laughs> wife likes this. And so she'll go in the pool when it's 50 degrees. Okay. And, you know, every 10th time I'll go with her, I'm like, okay, yeah. my knees hurt today. Let me go see if that helps. Yeah. Or I'll frequently, because I understand the, the research is good, but there are all sorts of ways to get healthy. Right. And so that's one way if people like it. Um, I think it goes back to that question, is this good for my brain or bad for it? Boosting dopamine is generally good if you're doing it in healthy ways and cold showers mm -hmm. or uh, cold, plunge, cold, yeah. cold plunge will do that. But I like to drip dopamine, not dump it. A cold plunge is dumping yes. dopamine. It increases like 250%. Yeah. And I like to drip it, which is- What does like that look like? Holding Tana's hand or making her, I make her a decaf cappuccino every morning. Um, I mean, just appreciating my life. Like I start every day with, today is gonna be a great day. Like I was looking forward to this interview. Uh, when I go to bed tonight, I'm gonna go on a treasure hunt. What went well today? But it's like, I just don't quickly jot down three things. I think about it. I like go hour by hour because like you, I'm busy. And so I have really cool things happen. I don't wanna even pay any attention to them. And right. so really having a time every night to review it. And if you have children, it's so cool. Like in the morning, go, hey, what are you looking forward to today? And when you have dinner together, what was the best part of your day? And it just becomes part of the fabric of the family to direct our minds to what we like way more than what we don't like. So helpful. Yeah, let's let's stay on that for a minute. Um, I mean, it sounds like that positive mental attitude stuff that you know I heard you know, a couple dec decades ago. Um, you know, positive self talk and all that. So, I like a, a different term. I would do would be accurate self talk. Yeah, in a positive direction. So, I do a test for all the patients who come to Amen Clinics. So I have 11 clinics around the country. We're the busiest imaging centers in the world for psychiatry. And we don't just do imaging, we treat people. But I give them a test that looks at negativity bias versus positivity bias. And people who have high negativity bias, they suffer way more with anxiety, with depression, with trauma. And so I like accurate thinking with a positivity bias training component. Yeah, yeah. Today is going to be a great day. What went well today? But I'm not a fan, in fact, just got into a fuss with John Gordon, who's very big on positivity. And he's like, Dr. Amon says it's not positive thinking, it's accurate thinking. Because positive thinking is I can have this third beer and it won't have a negative impact on me. Or I can have, you know, oh, yeah. oh I work hard all week, you know, I deserve this banana split. Yeah, or even extreme cases, uh, I got fired from my job today, no big deal. I mean, you could, you could positive think your way out of that one. Right, and that's potentially dangerous. There's this great study from Stanford where they looked at 1,540 10-year-old children in 1921. Okay. And then they followed them every decade for 90 years. Wow. 
And they looked at what went with health, success, and longevity. And it wasn't what you thought. Uh, it wasn't happiness, although I'm a huge fan of happiness. It wasn't a lack of anxiety. In fact, the don't worry, be happy people died the earliest hmm. from accidents and preventable illnesses. And I have an older brother who I adore, but he's one of those don't worry, be happy people, but he's also 150 pounds overweight because I have obesity in my family. Okay. And I'm like harassing him. It's like, this is bad for you. You need yeah. to like come play tennis with me. And then at some point I gave up because I'm like, wait, you're like way more invested in his health than he is. Well, is this, a, is this because it's denial? Because the don't worry, be happy attitude is this is not really happening or it's not a big deal. It's water off the duck's back, however you want to say it. But it's not reality. It's not accurate. Yeah. So you need some anxiety. So a lot of people come and it's like, I don't want to be anxious. And I'm like, mm, not a good goal. I said, let's think of anxiety from zero, you don't have any, to 100 where you can't leave your house because right. you're so anxious. I want you around 20. I want you to have enough anxiety that you're not driving in the rain at 120 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. I mean, I want you thinking about bad things can happen. Right. But because I know bad things will happen, I'm gonna do the right things and protect myself. So I want you to have enough anxiety that you make good decisions. I don't want you to have so much that you suffer. Right. But low anxiety, people suffer way more than everybody else because they end up filing for bankruptcy or they end up dying early from obesity or diabetes. And um, we're on this whole new, you can't talk about obesity, right? Can't fat shame anybody. I published three studies that show as your weight goes up, the size and function of your brain goes down. So when I talk about it online, I get all these haters and I'm like, my favorite New Testament verse is John 8, 32, know the truth and the <laughs> truth will set you free. When I figured out that connection, um, first through an article um, from the University of Pittsburgh, I lost 25 pounds. I'm like, I am not gonna shrink my brain. Okay, so pause, <laughs> so pause. So you're saying, the more extra weight that you're carrying around, it is it shrinking your brain or your brain? Is there more fat up there? Is that what? Is it like Less fat on, in your brain. Your brain is mostly fat. 60% of the solid weight of your brain is fat. So if someone calls you a fathead, say thank you. <laughs> um, but let me just back up just a second. If you want to keep your brain healthy or rescue it, if it's headed for trouble. You have to prevent or treat the 11 major risk factors that steal your mind. And the acronym is Bright Minds, like B is for blood flow, R is retirement and aging, I is inflammation. D is diabetes. If you're overweight and or have high blood sugar, mm -hmm. that's really bad for your brain. Well, what we discovered is if you have just that one risk factor, you have seven of the 11. You have less blood flow to your brain. Your brain looks older than you are. Fat produces something called inflammatory cytokines, fat stores, toxins. Um, this is problematic. Fat takes healthy testosterone, mm -hmm. really important, especially for men, and flips it, actually changes it to estrone, which is a cancer-promoting form of estrogen. And so if we look at our society that 50% are diabetic or pre-diabetic, 72% of Americans are overweight, 42% of us are obese. This is the biggest brain drain yeah. in the history of our democracy. Yeah. It's insidious. I, I w I'm not aware of it. I mean, that's shocking to me that you say that. But I now I want to go out and maybe lose a little bit more weight. Like, <laughs> yeah, I coined the term the dinosaur syndrome. I almost wish I didn't. But, you know, big body, little brain. You're going to become extinct. We need to get much more serious. So the whole supersize me uh, campaign with fast food restaurants is just a disaster. And it's not only calories, it's partially calories. 
1982 on average, Americans drank 225 calories a day. Today, they drank almost 500 calories a day. That extra 250 calories a day will put 23 pounds of fat a year on your body. Yeah. So no wonder we're always trying to lose weight. So the fastest way to lose weight is stop drinking your calories. Uh, let's let's stand there for a second and um, walk me through, you know, your morning routine and what you're having for breakfast. What are you what are you eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Are you what do you think about intermittent fasting, that kind of thing? So I mostly do intermittent fasting. Okay. Um, I mean, I have a decaf almond milk cappuccino in the morning. I make that for my wife. I'll also have a glass of water and squeeze in half of a lemon. And I'm spoiled. I'm always finding ways to make myself happy. There's a company called Sweet Leaf. I have no financial interest in them, although I should. Um, they make like 10 different flavors of stevia. And my favorite's chocolate. I, I like travel with it. Like I'm on a plane, you know, do you want something to drink? Sparkling water. And then we'll put a little couple of drops of chocolate stevia and I'm happy as clam. Yeah. So water with lemon, decaf, cappuccino, almond milk. Then I won't eat probably till 11 o'clock. And I make myself a shake, a protein shake. I have a company called Brain MD. Um, we have wonderful protein powder that's got no crap in it. What but kind of my protein vitamins is it? Is it a whey protein? It's plant protein. Plant protein. So it's a mix of pea and pumpkin uh, protein, tastes awesome. And it's got like no sugar. Mm -hmm. Where if you look at most protein powders, they have all sorts of crap yeah. in them. So, um, so I start the day, I put a half an avocado in it, some chia seeds in it. Um, maybe a half a cup of blueberries or strawberries. The avocado is for the healthy fats. The, the chia seed is the fiber mm -hmm. and the antioxidants and the berries, low sugar. Yep, I'm dialed into that as well. Yeah, and then I make something called NeuroGreens, which is a, a greens powder product that I love, smart mushrooms. So not psilocybin, but lion's mane and reishi and turkey tail and cordyceps. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's good. And then probably have a salad for lunch, maybe around one or two o'clock with olive oil and lemon. I like lemon a lot. Yep. And some sort of a protein, probably leftover from the night before. Mm -hmm. um, I make a... Uh, in fact, I just had one before I came, Brain on Joy, which is my grandfather was a candy maker. And so developmentally, I'm this combination of my father, whose favorite word when I was growing up was bullshit. His <laughs> second favorite word was no, but he ended up being the chairman of the board of a $4 billion company. He was very poor growing up and just he worked hard. Um, but he wasn't that nice when I was growing up. I mean, we sort of fixed that later, but I was named after my grandfather, who was a candy maker, who was the sweetest person on the planet. Mm -hmm. And, but he died too early because he ate too much of the fudge he made. Yeah. And so, uh, part of Brain MD, we make chocolate and chocolate coconut bars as, you know, it's my testament to my grandfather. But we do them obviously without sugar. I love that. Uh, do you find, uh, I don't know if you're counting calories, you know how much approximately you're eating a day, but have you noticed that there's a big change between, let's say, a decade ago or maybe two decades ago, like the way you're eating and the way you're eating now? Has it changed much or has it been pretty consistent? Oh, no, it's changed dramatically. Yeah. I, I didn't care about my own brain until I was 37. So I didn't care about my own brain, even though I was the top neuroscience student in medical school and I'm a double board certified psychiatrist. And when I looked at my brain for the first time in 1991, I'm like, well, damn, that's not good. <laughs> I, I never really thought about it. Yeah. Right. And most people, like we talked about when we started, they don't ever think about it their brain. And I live in Newport Beach, where I often say we care more about our faces, our boobs, our bellies, and our butts than we do our brain, which is insane. Yeah. And so as I started to care about my brain, 
I'm like, oh, the brain uses 20 to 30% of the calories you consume. If I feed it Jack in the Box, I'm gonna have a fast food mind. Yeah. No. And, and then I remember one of the parents of my autistic kids said when she took away gluten and dairy, her son got 50 new words the next week. Wow. And I'm like, okay, diet matters. Yeah. And some of our best testimonials come from food. You asked me about calories. There's all this controversy. There's no controversy in my mind. They absolutely count. Yeah. And it's like money. I think of calories like money. And I have plenty of money, but I hate wasting it. Even now, I hate wasting money. It's like, turn off the lights. It's like, why are the lights on? <laughs> Do I own stock in the electric company? Right. In fact, my kids got me stock in the electric company. <laughs> I don't like wasting calories yeah. because I know what obesity does. I know what belly fat does to your health. I don't want you to be underweight. I want you to be have a good BMI or your waist should be half your height or less. Right. And people in my family are fat if they're not really focused on it and it's harder to be at a healthy weight now because we're just being constantly lied to calories don't count alcohol's a health food <laughs> no yeah it's an important message i've heard you say the brain is always listening can you talk more about that and and i want to frame it i want to frame it around my 15 year old son because it's it's something I need to solve. So he's, he runs track and field. He, he runs the 400, occasionally runs the 800 and the mile. But right now he's running the 400, which is an all out sprint once around the track. Uh, he's a freshman in high school. And sometimes he lets his brain, uh, or his thoughts get the best of him. Uh, whether you want to call it negative thinking or getting psyched out or too much anxiety about the, sophomore that's running next to him who he thinks is just you know even though he's a year older might be better talk about how our brain is always listening and then maybe let's frame some work on some strategies on how to combat that so i wrote a book your brain is always listening and i talk about the dragons from the past that are always breathing fire on your emotional brain but there's a huge section in that book on ants automatic negative thoughts, the thoughts mm -hmm. that come into your mind automatically yes. and ruin your day. And I was 28 in my psychiatric residency at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center, sitting in one of the lecture rooms. And one of my professors said, you have to teach your patients not to believe every stupid thing they think. Thank you. And I'm like, <laughs> well, I believe every stupid thing I think, which caused me a lot of suffering. Yes. And it's like th there was no, so I might have a doctorate degree, not one class on how to manage my mind, something they should have taught me in second grade. Yeah. You don't have to believe every stupid thing you think. Thoughts come from all sorts of places. They may not even be yours. Thoughts can actually be from another generation. We know generational trauma actually gets transmitted through our genes. And then pretty soon I'm predicting the worst possible thing, even though not one bad thing happened to me. And so they come from past generations, from the voices of your mom, your dad, your siblings, your friends, your foes the news you watch or the music you listen to. And just because you have a thought has nothing to do with whether or not it's true, yeah. whether or not it's helpful. From an evolutionary standpoint, people thought negatively tended to survive more because when they woke up and went, where's the lion? Well, that protected them. Yeah. But we don't need that because the lion is in a cage or in Africa. Yeah. And the amygdala, right? Like that, that area of your brain. The whenever you have that negative thought, it fires up your emotional brain. Yeah. 
And so here's the exercise. And, and I have a kid's book that I love called Captain Snout and the Superpower Questions. Whenever you feel sad, whenever you feel mad, whenever you feel nervous or out of control, write it down and then ask yourself, is it true? And then write the opposite of that thought and go, I wonder if the opposite is actually true too. Mm -hmm. If you can diffuse the ants, if you can eliminate them or kill them, you're so much happier. But if you have no skill, this negative thought, this ant, attaches to another ant. Mm -hmm. So they begin to link with other negative thoughts, stack, and then they attack you. Mm -hmm. And the way to do it, and if you've been a negative thinker for a long time, like I sort of was that, right? I mean, I was smaller than everybody else. I was sort of irrelevant in my family. Um, it takes a while to change it. Yeah. And so I tell my patients, it's like, I want a hundred of your worst thoughts. <laughs> and then we go through this five-step process. I want to eliminate each one of them, or at least put each of those negative thoughts under a microscope and let's just shine lights on them. Know the truth. The truth will set you free. So it's not positive thinking, no, I'm after. It's accurate thinking right? with positive spin, right? In Philippians 4, 8, I love using New Testament stuff. I did a big program with Rick Warren and Saddleback Church called The Daniel Plan. We've got sure. thousands of churches to do this program. But Philippians 4, 8, think, so this is a direction from the Apostle Paul, think on whatever is true, right, good, lovely, excellent, worthy of praise. Let your mind dwell on this thing. And it's hard if you're watching social media. It's hard if you're watching the news. It's hard if you're involved in this political divide or the societal unrest. You see how society is eroding our mind and planting the ants. There's, yeah, there's, a, there's these voices literally. There's you know. a lot <laughs> of, and that's why teenagers at historically high levels are struggling with anxiety, depression, suicide. Study out just two weeks ago, 57% of teenage girls have persistent sadness. That's so sad. Yeah. It makes me want to cry. 24% of them have thought seriously about suicide and 13% have tried suicide. This is unlike anything. So we have to like go, so why is that? Yeah, so what, what do we do about it? Is it just like the elimination diet? We start taking those things out one by one? Yeah, and rather than think of it like mental health or mental illness, I told my dad I wanted to be a psychiatrist in 1979. He asked me why I didn't want to be a real doctor, why I wanted to be a nut doctor and hang out with nuts all day long. It's not kind. Um, but, you know, society has a negative view of getting help. You know, yeah, I'm like, the stigma, yeah. I'm not daft, I'm not crazy. You know, I've heard it a thousand times. Oh, no, you know, you should go see Dr. Raymond. No, I'm not going to see a psychiatrist. I'm not crazy. So let's get rid of the term mental illness. It's the big lesson I learned from the imaging work I do. Most psychiatric illnesses are not mental health challenges. They're brain health challenges. Get your brain healthy and your mind will follow. Everybody wants a better brain. Nobody wants a mental illness. Right. And so if we just think, oh, if I want a better brain, I have to eat right. I have to sleep just like you were talking about, probably shouldn't poison it. You probably need to exercise and engage in new learning. Some <laughs> simple supplements like saffron or omega-3 fatty acids optimize my vitamin D level. Mm -hmm. Now I have a better brain and with a better brain, I'm happier. With a better brain, I actually make better decisions, which means I'm happier, right? right. Because when your brain's not right, you're sadder, sicker, poorer, because your decisions aren't right. So you're less successful. Yeah. And we know success helps people 
be happier. It's clearly not the the whole whole thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm the light bulb just kind of went on just now. I'm I'm seeing it in a very different way. That I'm guilty of this too. Like I I am my own worst enemy. If I'm feeling anxious or I'm feeling you know whatever I'm feeling, what else am I doing? to either, you know, distort or enhance that experience. I mean, there will be times when I'm going to be legitimately sad or upset, angry. Those emotions are fine. But like, am I contributing to the damage or am I contributing to the success or making my own burden lighter by eliminating some of these things? And that when you causing... stop believing everything you think. Yeah. I mean, it's just, so for the, biological circle is this good for my brain or bad for it mm -hmm. for the psychological circle is it true and it's directing managing your mind and people struggle with depression they have years often decades of negative thought patterns so it's like they have built this pathway this rut in their brain um that's big and so the first time they kill an ant, it helps. You got to go after a hundred of them because you need to build a new pathway, which takes time. Yeah. And remember when we were kids and we learned how to shoot free throws. Well, in basketball, the first time was terrible. <laughs> and then it was a bit better. And then it was a bit better. But the only way you make them during crunch time is if you practice. Mm -hmm. If you do it over and over and over. So if you're thinking negative over and over and over, you're building that highway of yeah. negativity. So you've got to build it over and over and over to make it unconscious, right? Because most athletes, they don't perform consciously. Right. It's, it's all memory. It's all unconscious because they practice it so many times. And we have to get away from negativity, 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 which means you have to turn off the news. I mean, I'm sorry, but you got to turn off the news because the news is no longer the news. Right. The news is about negativity to get your attention, right? It's about mind share and, you know, whether it's Fox and I can scare you and demonize re Republicans or it's CNN where I can scare you. No, Fox demonized Democrats, CNN demonized Republicans. It's so irritating yeah, it's, because it's not the news right. anymore. And But they're making a lot of money yeah. because they're selling you copper underwear. <laughs> so let's take it back to my son on the track <laughs> and give him some advice for like pre-race. So visualize it. You got to visualize you performing perfectly. Okay. And, and not just the day of the race. You need to be every day at practice. You need to do mental training. So I have a fun story. Um, I don't know if I'm telling too many stories, but this will help him. Yeah. Uh, Alicia Newman is a Canadian pole vaulter. She's beautiful, smart, and she had a bad concussion, which is why she came to see me and did my show. And lots of negative thoughts. She was just filled with, if I don't win a gold medal at the next Olympics, I will be nothing. I will be a failure. My children okay. won't even love me. Right. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm like, got to get these thoughts right. And so as we got her thoughts right, we also, because she's an Olympic athlete, got to start putting affirmations in your life about what you want, not what you don't want. Mm -hmm. And what does that sound like? It's... I am going to compete. So rather than I'm going to get the gold medal, it's I'm going to compete for a gold medal in the next Olympics. Okay, good. And I'm going to do it by being a flexible problem solver. I love that. And I will not get upset until the 12th thing has gone wrong because you used to get upset when something wouldn't go right. And I'm okay. like, shit happens, own it. And... um so we actually wrote this paragraph out and she reads it every day. And then she visualizes her gold medal jump at a world record perfectly. Mm -hmm. And if it, she doesn't run it perfectly in her mind, she just does the <laughs> whole thing over and over again. So for your son, affirmation, what do I want? 
and then he runs the race perfectly over and over in his head. Yeah. And when he notices the ants, you can't do that. You're not enough. You mm -hmm. won't, you'll fail. You write them down and you correct them. Mm -hmm. And the more you do it, the better you become. And she was just named the 2023 world indoor pole vaulting champion. I was like so proud of her. Yeah, that's amazing. So tell me whether or not this advice is on point or not. So the advice that I give him is, okay, I know you're thinking about, you know, what place you're going to come in. I said, just focus on the process of running, like get your form as good as you can make it, do your best, but like just focus on the doing and then whatever the result is as a result of you doing your best is what it is. So if you can walk off that track and say, I, my form was as good as I could do today. I ran as fast as I could, I, you know, whatever exertion I gave, then you've done your best and then it could be. So I, I like that. Fifth I place or first say place, but... the goal is, shouldn't be to win. The goal should not be to be the best. That's a prescription for unhappiness. Right. So I've seen some of the world's most accomplished athletes and some of them are miserable. Yeah. Because I had to be the best, which means I had to beat everybody else. So just think of what that means socially yeah. for you. The goal should be your best. That's right. And that's what you're telling him to do. Yeah. Your best and root for other people to be their best too. Yeah. And because then what you're doing is you're connecting and competing at mm -hmm. the same time. I mean, I love winning, but I love it when other people win too. Yeah. I just, I want to be my best. Yeah. And that's the prescription for happiness. I'm glad that you said that. We, we have this conversation all the time where he says, dad, tell me the truth, you know, rate me one to 10. <laughs> so when he was playing basketball, cause he loves basketball, I said, you're six, you're six out of 10. You're a good player, but there's a lot of people better than you. So I said, you just have to put in the work. You gotta, you know, shoot the free throws, take the outside shots, do the training, get your handles. You know, right now you're six. Um, and he played flag football. And uh, when he first started, you know, he was just six years old, seven years old. And it, you know, he, he wasn't a very good player and we worked on it. And um, every year I'd give him a better score. And I, I was honest with him. I would say, you know, uh, you run fast, but you got terrible hands or, you know, but we would work on it. And so he trusts my judgment. And I said, with regards to his running, I said, you have the, you have the opportunity to be a 10. You're that good, but it's the mental part you got to put together. You're psyching yourself out. You're telling yourself negative thoughts. You know, you're letting the ants win. And I said, if you just focus on the process, if you just focus on your form and your training, I wouldn't doubt that you'd come, you know, you'd get the ranking that you want in your mind, but like, don't even focus on that. Just focus on the process of doing it and then let your natural skill, you know, show you the results. So another thing to say to him is every day we win or we learn. We yes. never fail, we win or we learn. For sure, yeah. Take bad days and turn it into good data. And if you're always paying attention, what, you know, Alicia and I, what are you thinking about right before you jump? Sometimes it's anger that'll motivate her. Somebody she's <laughs> mad at. Yeah. Sometimes it's, you know, the hardware for the hard work. It's, it's it just, if you could get him just to be in a learning mindset, mm -hmm. I think it's been one of the secrets to my success. It's, you know, it's like, don't fail, I learn. And if I can learn from every experience, I'm just so much better. Yeah, and I'm also trying really hard as a parent. And then you're in the process, right? You're always yeah. in process rather than it's, I get an Olympic gold medal or I'm shit. Yeah. And I, I am trying really hard to do the right thing as a parent. I think um, he'll he'll look at me after a race and I'll know right away whether or not he's done his best. And he goes, are you disappointed? Mm. And I said, well, say more about that. Why, why would I be disappointed? He goes, I didn't do my best. 
And I say, how do you feel about that? Uh, because he's looking for my approval or my affirmation. And, and I just, I, what I usually say to him is, if you know you didn't do your best, then that's sort of the punishment, right? Like that's the, that's the downside to not doing your best because you know you but didn't do it. I would let him do that. I would go, what can we learn? So tell me why. Because he's probably always trying to do his best. And I, I always think of good coaches. Yeah. You notice what people do right and you teach. Notice what people do right and you teach. Bear Bryant, the famous uh, Alabama football coach, sure. never showed his players film of what they did wrong. He's like, you're probably beating yourself up for that. Let me show you what you did right. And we're going to do more of what we do right. I like that. And so, you know, I think the best teachers, the best coaches, notice what you do right, encourage, and then teach. Yeah. And and then I would look at some of the brain factors on why you might have had a bad day. It's, did you go to bed late? Right. Did you have screens before you go to bed, which turns off the production of melatonin at night if kids have their iPads or phones or TV on after dark? It disrupts them. Did right. they eat properly? Did they have caffeine? Um, too early because if you're going to use it to help you compete, you have to go, what's the right window? I mean, I'm not a huge fan of it, but a lot of athletes use it. And, you know, oh, I had a little bit here. And every day he's got a journal and he's like, oh, I did really well. What were my habits? Was I taking care of my brain and body before or you know, did I stay up too late playing video games right. or, or whatever? And if you can get them in a learning mindset, we can get entrepreneurs in a learning mindset. I did this and boy, that didn't work, but I did this and it worked. So you end up doing more of what works. Yeah, that correlation causation. Now let's shift gears a little bit. You said something earlier that I've read about, but didn't know was a fact. And that is that Things are passed down genera generationally, like you know, if you're an anxious person or if you are a worrier or you have negative thoughts. I, I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't know it was a fact. That is a fact. So they did this great study. It's a it's a fact. If you have grandparents or great grandparents that were in the Holocaust, you're way more likely to be anxious. You're more likely to experience. PTSD after a traumatic event. Wow. 30% of children of soldiers who were in Iraq end up with symptoms of trauma. There's a great study at Emory where they took mice and made them afraid of the scent of cherry blossoms. So whenever the scent of cherry blossoms was in the air, they would shock the mice. I mean, mild shocks, but it's like that scent freaked out. So it's conditioning, right? Like Pavlov and his dogs. That's not a surprise. The surprising thing is their babies were afraid of the scent of cherry blossoms. Yeah. And their grandbabies were afraid of the scent of cherry <laughs> blossoms. You want to take care of your trauma before you have children. <laughs> yeah. Because that trauma changes your genes. Women, for example, they're born with all of the eggs in their ovaries they will ever have. And what happens to them turns on or off certain genes, making illness more or less likely in their babies and in their grandbabies. Because when a woman has a baby girl, well, that baby girl has the eggs of her grandbabies. Yeah, And so it's the same thing's true for men. It'll change the genes in their sperm. Um, there's a fascinating book I like a lot called It Didn't Start With You about generational trauma by Mark Wolin. He'd wow. be an interesting interview wow. for you. It's, it's all about generational trauma. And so I love doing family histories on my patients. Like I wanna know about your grandparents, I wanna right. know about your parents, because that matters. You know, I, one person whose um, grandfather died 
um, when his mom was 16. It was like all of a sudden, and that changed the trajectory of her life. But just think of what that trauma yeah. did to the messaging in her ovaries. It turned on anxiety uh, genes, which then get transmitted. See, I, I don't know how many people actually realize this. Now, uh, I've been very vocal on, again, this channel, talking a lot about my personal life, my childhood trauma. Um, I'm adopted, so I didn't know uh, my biological parents until I was in my mid-30s, late 30s. Um, and, and I had been on a search since I was 12 to try and find them. And um, when I did find them, it was not what I expected. Um, I found my mom first, but she did not want to be found. And it ended sort of uh, in sort of a disaster where she still refused to uh, meet me or acknowledge me and had her attorneys send me letters oh, to the fact. How heartbreaking. It was, yeah. Um, and it's something that I still grapple with emotionally, you know, um, as I'm trying to figure out my own brain and why I get certain thoughts. I think maybe out of a defense mechanism, my brain bounced back the other way. I'm, I have constantly positive thoughts in, in the storm of, of either reality, uh, negativity or actual bad, when bad things happen, I'm usually at my best because it's like, you know, I put up the shield or I, you know, I, I just weather the storm, let it beat down on me and I'm okay. And I just soldier through for whatever reason. Um, but that still it makes me think a lot about um, my behavior sometimes. Sure, it made me resilient or it's made me resilient, but also I know that it's affecting me. And now that you say it's generational, now I'm thinking, how is that affecting my children? Um, I found my dad eventually, and uh, my dad was different. He was uh, sort of a, a hippie in the 60s, very liberal-minded, and when I found him, he was very open to meeting me, and it was a great reunion, and then he explained all about meeting my mother, and that explained a lot about her behavior too. She was very private, her family was very religious, she was Christian, he was Jewish, uh, they took the relationship too far in high school. She became pregnant. Her parents were not thrilled that she'd become pregnant and not married. And she was 17, not to mention the boy that got her pregnant was Jewish. And that was sort of an, another thing. So there were several layers uh, why that relationship didn't work out. But um, I, I was always, uh, and I'm still wondering uh, about this feeling of uh, abandonment or I have sometimes the triggers around rejection. And then it's one of the things that I'm trying to train my brain to, to resist. So your brain is always listening. The first dragon is the abandoned, invisible, and insignificant dragon. So yeah. that would probably be one of your dragons. Mm -hmm. And But it's like, own it. Yeah. Deal with it. And then, um, you know, there's, there's a great saying, argue with reality, welcome to hell. <laughs> and it's okay that happened what am i going to do about it right right and that's why i love uh, this word responsibility never means fault it means your ability to respond which right. obviously you have the ability to respond as soon as you blame your mom for how your life is turning out, you become a victim right. and you can't change anything. You know, it's the number one hallmark of self-defeating behavior. Yes. Blaming somebody else for how your life is turning out. And so it's okay, what is it I can do today that moves my life forward? Moves yeah. my life in the direction. I want to go. If I blame my colleagues, you know, they don't like me enough. Mm -hmm. It's like no, I don't even think about them. Like yeah. most days, I just don't, I don't think about the things that hold me back. I'm like, what do I want? It's my behavior getting me what, what do I want in my relationships, my work, my money, my physical, emotional spirit. What do I want? It's my behavior getting me that. Yeah. No, I love that. And, and, and you were probably blessed 
to not be raised by her. I think that now, and you know, who knows, right? I, I mean, I may who, never know. Who knows? It's one way to look at it. But clearly, she didn't have the emotional resources to take care of you when she was so young. Yeah. And so, were, were your adopted parents cool? Were they nice people? Yeah, I would say the nice people. You know, uh, my mom was married three times before I was 16. So we had the whole divorce thing. So there was that. Um, so your adopted mom was married. My adopted mom was married three times, yeah. So I didn't really grow up with a dad, and that was challenging. But, you know, on the positive side, it's I feel like that experience has made me more hyper-focused on being the best dad that I can be. So I want to be there for my kids, and I want to do it differently. I know that they grew up with certain circumstances that, you know, that was out of, that's out of my control. That's probably out of their control. It's just what happened. Right. Uh, but like yeah. 2008 was hard on everybody. And yes, you know, you made the best decision you could with the information you have to start your own company. And then the world changed. Yeah. Right. And so I like, I'm friends with Ariana Grande. And she has this fun song called Thank You Next. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I initially just thought it was sort of like a dumb pop song and about all of her relationships. And then when I really listened to it, I text her, I go, that's mental health in three words. Thank you. Gratitude for what happened, whatever it is, because you can't argue with reality. Welcome to hell. Gratitude looking forward. Yeah. Right. So the pandemic is clearly an awful thing except those who have had kids the kids were hostage in the house <laughs> i had more time with my kids yeah right i love that part okay that happened what's next yep looking forward gratitude looking forward okay so we've covered a lot of ground thank you uh, what didn't we talk about that we should cover well we talked about the first circle is this good for my brain or bad for it the second circle is it true with your thoughts the third circle is notice what you like about the people in your life way more than what you don't. Every day you're reinforcing behaviors you like or behaviors you don't like by what you notice. So if you're only noticing the negative, you're gonna get a lot more negativity. Mm -hmm. And then the spiritual circle, it's why. Why am I here? What do I want? And people go, you know, how can you be a scientist and talk about the spiritual circle? Like it takes way more faith to believe we're here by random chance. Oh yeah, I couldn't agree more. Then there's some sort of creative design. Unless of course you've lived in Barstow. Then <laughs> random chance sort of makes sense. Oh, so I lost my dad a couple of years ago. Uh, and we had this talk a lot. He, he died young, unfortunately. He had some health issues and um, it didn't work out. And, uh, but we talked a lot about the spiritual side of things. And I, I told him how I feel. I said, I do believe that there's life after. I don't know what it looks like. I do believe in a higher power. I don't know what he, she, it looks like, but like I have a feeling there's something after, that there's a consciousness or our spirit, our souls, you know, continue to live on. I have that, at least that faith or that belief inside me. And, uh, and so every once in a while now, you know, now that he's gone, I'll think about him. And sometimes I, f I feel his presence. I don't know if that's uh, uh, real or not, but it feels real to me. I feel like in a way he's sort of almost like that Yoda, <laughs> sometimes whispering uh, advice in my ear. Or I feel at least feel his presence. So I'm, I'm very much on, aligned with that spiritual spirituality. I don't have it fi figured out by any means, but I feel it's real. I do too. There's nothing I've learned in medicine or in neuroscience that makes me think it's not real. Yeah. In fact, and some some of my colleagues will make fun of me, and I'm like, people who believe in God have bigger temporal lobes, so don't tell me that's a small brain activity to believe in God. Um, to believe this is all random and has no meaning and no purpose, that's depressing. To yeah. Me. And it just, it makes no sense. You know, as I connect the dots in my life, they all go toward the universe is good. And I think Einstein said that you have to decide for yourself 
is the universe good and benevolent or is it bad? Mm -hmm. And there is there is a lot of evil and there is a lot of bad. Um, my brain imaging work helps me understand why. You have the biggest library of, of brain images. What's your biggest takeaway from that, looking at all those images? Um, most psychiatric illnesses are not mental health problems. They're brain health problems. Um, mild traumatic brain injuries, the major cause of psychiatric problems. You saw the shooting in Kentucky this week. He had multiple concussions uh, playing sports. In fact, he wore a helmet playing basketball. Um, that was big in the news. And I'm like, anybody think? damaged brains are committing these horrific crimes? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that if I don't want to get dementia, I need to start 20 years early. I'd like, get on the program. As soon as you know that you have a brain, keep it healthy. Mm -hmm.